Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, another of our COVID-themed medical grand rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. Uh, the title of our grand round today is The Fourth Wave and Is It Safe to Fill in the blank. Uh, you see the instructions here uh, for this conference. If you have uh, questions, uh, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll uh, get to as many as we can. Um, the session will be recorded and uh, uh, and uh, show up on YouTube tonight at probably about seven o'clock tonight. And I'll tweet out the address, but it's uh, there as well. And if you're interested in closed captioning, it is available. So as usual, uh, we find ourselves at a confusing juncture in the pandemic uh, uh, with a lot of cross-cutting forces where we're kind of toggling between some days that feel very optimistic and then, uh, quote, impending doom in the words of CDC Director Walensky last week. Uh, how you see the world, I think, depends a little bit on uh, whether or not you've been vaccinated, uh, but also on where you live. And uh, I was just looking at the data at UCSF Medical Center today, where we have a grand total of four COVID patients in the hospital. That number was about 100 uh, in January. And we have uh, zero patients on ventilators, and that number has been as high as 20 or I think even 25. Uh, our overall test positivity rate in the hospital is 0.7%. So all of these numbers are just fantastic. And yet you hear about other parts of the country and other parts of the world and about the variants and it's uh, easy to be somewhat pessimistic. So we're gonna try to reconcile all of that today with uh, three uh, uh, guests who I think are well known by now have all appeared on uh, Grand Rounds uh, before. Uh, in the first segment, George Rutherford, uh, who is professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and medical director of the Prevention and Public Health Group, will come on and uh, give us another of his uh, uh, really superb updates on where we are and uh, help us figure out whether to be optimistic, pessimistic, or a little bit of both. Uh, George will uh, speak for about 15 minutes and we'll have about five minutes or so for questions and answers. And then uh, we will have a segment where we talk about uh, whether it's safe to do various things. And uh, our two discussants, uh, again, are familiar to all of you, I think. Uh, one is Monica Gandhi, who is Professor of Medicine and Associate Director, uh, Associate Division Chief of the Division of HIV, Infectious Disease and Global Medicine. She is the Director of the UCSF Gladstone Center for AIDS Research and medical director of our HIV clinic at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And she will be on with Peter Chen Hong, also I think familiar to all of you by now, who is professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at UCSF Health. He's also associate dean for our regional campuses in the School of Medicine and directs the immunocompromised host infectious disease program uh, at UCSF. And uh, Peter and Monica have slightly different worldviews on, on uh, what people can and can't do safely. So there should be some, some sparks flying when we get to that. So that will be uh, no lecture, just a discussion. <clears throat> I will pitch most of the scenarios, but if you have some that you wanna hear from them, please do submit them in the Q&A. So it should be really an engaging and interesting uh, session befitting the moment that we find ourselves in, in the pandemic. Uh, so let's start off with George Rutherford. Thanks, Bob. It's a pleasure to be back. I uh, hope all's well with everyone. I'm going to start my slides and we can get off to the races here. So I, I first wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the international uh, situation. And uh, this is uh, something I think is really quite telling uh, that the US and uh, the UK have done these fabulous jobs getting people vaccinated. And even the UK strategy um, that uh, Dr. Wachter knows so well of a single dose, and then when we get around to it, a second dose, uh, has produced this massive drop off uh, in transmission. Whereas other places that have done been less, uh, 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 have had less success with vaccination, uh, like France and uh, even Canada and Brazil, uh, have not really been able to move the dial here uh, very much. A real interesting case is Chile. And uh, perhaps we should come back and talk about that some someday. Uh, Chile, which has done very well in getting people vaccinated, has not been able to drive down its rate yet. And it's a little unclear why that is. Here in the United States, COVID cases are increasing in parts of the United States uh, uh, here in March and, and April. 
We've had 30.9 million total cases, uh, 73,000 yesterday and a 65,000 seven day average. This is what we're talking about, this little blip out here. Deaths are continuing to decline, which is good news, although we still have 2,500 plus deaths. The cases seem to be occurring in, in a couple of clusters. One big one is in Michigan. Uh, and uh, it's really this Eastern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan has had really a large outbreak. And as you can see, it's almost at the height of the, uh, of the uh, winter outbreak. Um, there, this is, seems to be, uh, this has a, several interesting characteristics to it. It seems to be driven largely by variants, specifically the UK B117 variant, but it also seems to have been at least initially spurred on by youth athletic events in a pattern we really haven't seen before. Um, Minnesota is also probably part of that, uh, of that larger cluster, uh, but uh, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, the sort of Connecticut, that sort of Eastern seaboard cluster seems to have been starting to turn the corner a little bit and, uh, and fall. So I, all eyes are on the upper Midwest right now. And here you can see what it looks like uh, uh, in, a, uh, uh, in more of a heat map. Here in the east, I'm sorry, not here, there in the east, uh, it's a little bit all over the place. Interestingly, if you were to look at a map of Canada, you would see that Ontario has had a huge outbreak. Ontario abuts the US kind of here, here, a little bit up in here, and then way over here on this side of the, uh, on this side of the Great Lakes. So it, it's a, the borders are closed. I'm not quite sure what that all means, but it's something to be uh, cognizant of. And here I've listed the states with the most recent uh, cases per hundred, most recent uh, cases per hundred thousand, starting with Michigan and then going down. Okay. Um, here in Michigan, uh, not here, in Michigan, uh, this is the estimated share of the cases from the B117 variant, which is approaching 70%. And if you look at overall numbers of cases, right, versus overall numbers of B117 cases, you can see that there's really is, it goes up as the B117 variants start to go up and you can see that kind of back in here. It's a similar pattern in Minnesota where you're approaching 70% of the, of the uh, of isolates of variants are the B117 and they're accounting for a disproportionate number of the, uh, of the, uh, of the new cases as well. Here in California, we're faring uh, much better. We have a statewide uh, effective reproductive number of 0 0.80. Only 1% of all tests in California are currently positive. Hospitalizations continue to fall. Uh, as uh, Dr. Wachter said, it's four at UCSF. If you add that, if you multiply that by, by five point whatever, or by 500, you get, you get up to 2000 uh, cases uh, statewide. Overall, the ICU capacity is all the way back up again. Uh, you can see that this gradual decline, this really is not going up at all. Uh, this is really very flat. Uh, and the, the counties with increasing uh, cases here recently are all very small counties like Del Norte and uh, places like that. Um, California does, has had 3.66 uh, million cases and 59,000 603 deaths. We're continuing to add a little bit less than 2,000 cases a day. So that's something to be cognizant of when everybody says this has all gone away. It hasn't. They we're still getting 2,200 cases a day. And depending on what you think the ratio is between diagnosed and reported cases and all infections, I think it's about two, two and a half. This could represent as many as 5,000 new case, new infections a day. However, Given our success with vaccination, given low, low rates, uh, the governor announced on Tuesday uh, that California was going to move away from its, the famous tier system, which gives you Merced County, Inyo County here in purple, most of the state in, uh, in orange, except for the Central Valley and the from the San Joaquin and the Sacramento Valleys. Here's Del Norte up here in case you were wondering where that was. Um, and it, you know, it says that we have to have adequate uh, doses of vaccine to vaccinate everybody who wants to be vaccinated. And we have, have to have a consistently low burden of disease, which they're gonna measure through hospitalizations. 
um, meaning a, a thing that's a much easier number to count and a much more kind of meaningful number since we don't know how many, um, since that's what we're really trying to prevent is hospitalizations and death. There'll be a continued mandate for masking and then testing or, or vaccination requirements for large scale higher risk events. And the city just put out some guidance about this like about 10 minutes ago, which I have yet to digest, but you can come back and find that online. Here in the Bay Area, we really reached a steady state. There's stuff that some that are going up here, Alameda is going up and others that are going down, San Mateo, uh, Solano, uh, Marin are all going down. So it's a kind of mixed bag. Everybody has low case counts except for Solano and Napa uh, and the, um, uh, uh, the R sub E's are all well below uh, uh, one and only in Napa is at point, is it over 0.9 to 0.92. And the positive uh, percent of tests positive are low all across the board. Uh, here at, uh, in San Francisco, it's 0.8%. Uh, the other thing is that San Francisco, the num this number really is 2.05, uh, which means we're not, meet we're not meeting the criteria for the yellow tier uh, yet. Uh, we may meet that next week. We, then we'd have to have three weeks at the yellow tier before we could actually move into the yellow tier. So that would be somewhere around April the 23rd. Um, anyway, this is the Bay Area here. And you can see how kind of flat it is, how it's really flat. And that's a balancing act amongst all these counties. COVID vaccine uh, 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 dosing is going, as my father would say, like gangbusters, uh, 20.1 uh, million doses administered, uh, including the governor who got vaccinated is because he's over 50 uh, a little earlier this week. Uh, we're still vaccinating. Um, this, we just don't know what the counts are in here, uh, but you know, around more than 300,000 people a day for the last seven days, 34% of Californians have received one dose or more 19% have been fully vaccinated in San Francisco. The estimates have, are that 45.6% uh, have had more than one dose. These number is high because there are a lot of non-San Franciscans who get vaccinated here. Um, we expect this to open up on April 15th to everyone 16 to 49 years old. Uh, and here you can see the, the share uh, uh, by different country companies. So Pfizer is 50%, Moderna is 43%, and J&J &J is seven uh, percent and over here I just put in the uh, purport the numbers of doses administered by county and the proportion that are fully vaccinated and you can see Alameda uh, is 25.4 Contra Costa 25 San Francisco 27.4 uh, percent fully vaccinated interestingly in San Francisco where you think this would be the you know the most straightforward to do because it's dense and uh, all that um, there are, there is under still uh, a residual of people over 75 and people over 65 who have not yet been vaccinated. And that's a major thrust uh, that the city's undertaking, trying to crack into those, uh, uh, into those areas. A lot of this, some of this is in Chinatown. That seems to be one of the areas that's disproportionately affected and to get all this uh, taken care of. Um, variants continue to be on the uh, on the agenda. Um, this is the B117 variant, the map of it, and I just put the, the states in here so you wouldn't think that California is at the top of the uh, at the top of the list. But Florida, home of the famous spring break, has the most cases. And Michigan and and Minnesota, where there this is where the upper Midwest outbreak is going on, have the uh, second and third most cases. Uh, Colorado, for, for some reason, has a lot of cases, and then we always have a a fair number of cases uh, as well. Um, in California, it's the same graph. You can see that the proportion of estimated cases from B117 has gone up. It's not over 50%, it's hovering somewhere around 40%. Uh, and it, uh, but it hasn't really overtaken, it hasn't driven the uh, overall epidemic curve. And part of that is, is that we have so much of the local variant, the uh, so-called West Coast variant, formerly known as the California variant, uh, with uh, 9,200, 9,300 uh, uh, isolates as opposed to 873 of the B117. And I think especially here in Northern California um, that these uh, isolates, are these, uh, uh, these strains are outcompeting the B117 uh, variant and may hold this down over time. We'll have to see how that works out. 
Um, and the good and that's the good news about that is that there was a letter published in the New England Journal yesterday that showed that the B1429 variant, one of the two California variants, sorry, West Coast variants, is susceptible both to Moderna and uh, and Novavax uh, vaccines. This is relative to uh, the uh, the wild type uh, vaccine. So you can see that, and and over here, it just gives you an idea of how much difference we're talking about. This is um, the B1429 here on this side. This is the South African strain on this side, and you can see that it's you know we're it's not exactly the same, but it's not that far off either. And what they concluded is modestly lower value and neutralization titers against the B1429 variant seen in the study is similar to what we saw previously when neutralization of the B117 variant with the UK variant was tested with the same assay using serum samples obtained from recipients of the Moderna and the Novavax vaccines. These results and the high efficacy shown by these vaccines suggest that vaccine elicited neutralizing antibodies are likely to remain effective against the B1429 variant, which I think is plenty good news. And then finally, just to wrap up, um, you will remember that UCSF sent people to the Navajo Nation uh, during just a, you know, a brutal period for them of, of out of control transmission uh, the Navajo uh, Nation um, in late March reported a day with there were no new cases and no new deaths. Um, and uh, this is in the face of massive vaccination with uh, more than 50% of the, of the population being completely vaccinated. Uh, and they're now proceeding, you know, they're now perking along at, at single doses per day. And I think this is quite a remarkable uh, story. So I've stopped there and I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Fabulous, thank you so much. Let me just pull that down. Uh, so a ton of questions, let's go for about, we can go for about eight minutes. Um, sounds like the governor made a bet that June 15th will be great. That's both a biological and probably a political bet. Uh, do you think that's a good bet? Well, I can't speak to politics. Well, no, I know that. I think biologically, general. it's not a bad bet. I think you know we're in the we're in the driver's seat. Um, uh, I, who knows what's really going on with the B one one seven variant in Southern California? Uh, some of the wild cards are are youth sports, uh, which we've seen have uh, been at the at the core of the resurgence in Michigan, um, and then and then vaccination and vaccination is going really really fast. I think I'd be a lot more comfortable with that bet if I knew that FDA were about to grant authorization to um, Pfizer vaccine down to 12 years of age. Um, and then you could really get all these kids vaccinated and take that off the table as a potential uh, threat. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a, not a bad bet. Uh, I was on forum yesterday. I guess they couldn't get hold of you probably, but yeah. no, uh, no. with a, <laughs> a political writer who was asked that same question and he said, you can't disentangle these things in the governor's office, right? It's everything's biological, everything's political, and it, it, there's a huge Venn diagram of this stuff. Of course, uh, I'm still not 100% sure I can or I I, I understand Michigan. Um, you know, youth sports. They got plenty of youth sports in Florida. They got plenty of youth sports in Texas. Um, they got plenty of UK variants, and at least in Florida. So, what is what is it about Michigan that you think, or is there just some randomness to this, and it just happens to hit a state and takes off, and you can't necessarily explain it? I think there's some randomness to it. What they have there is hockey that they don't have in the other places, and um, there are a couple of very early uh, large outbreaks that involved hockey teams and hockey leagues and hockey tournaments. I mean, I, they probably have some hockey in Florida and Texas, but not that not as much as in. Michigan and Minnesota. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think that's an awfully facile explanation. I don't think they've really picked it all the way down to the, uh, down to the core of what's really going on. The other thing is, is with this huge outbreak in Ontario, whether that has any influence at all. Now I realize the borders are supposed to be closed, but how, how, how much they're really closed or, you know, or for people going back and forth every day, who knows, um, mm -hmm. but we just don't, I, I just, I just can't tell you, but that's what they're saying right now. Yeah. Any reason to think the vaccines are not working as we think they normally would in, in Michigan with all the UK variants? They certainly seem to be working perfectly well in the UK. Yeah. No, I don't think there's any reason to, to worry about that. The real right. question is, and I, I mentioned this early on, is Chile. And why is it not working in Chile that has a large portion of its 
population vaccinated. They use a lot of, of uh, Sinovac uh, vaccine, uh, the Chinese vaccine, uh, which might explain it. That may have some other more limited uh, um, coverage for uh, for variants. Now, I'm told by friends in Michigan that they're seeing a ton of hospitalizations, and you would think if what's going on is young people who are unvaccinated are being not too careful, and particularly youth in sports, you'd see a big disconnect between case numbers and hospitalization numbers. Do you know what's going on hospitalization-wise? It's going up. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, that it's hard, as we learned from Sweden, uh, it's hard to disconnect what goes on in younger people with what goes on in older people. Uh, there was a real clear evidence of, of this that CDC published from Wisconsin towards the end of the summer that showed the summer surge uh, in like 18 to 35 year olds being followed by a surge in people over 75 about a week later. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, the, these populations are fluid, They're, they interact, they mix, and, um, you know, it's just not. Uh, it's just not, it just doesn't happen the way you'd think it would happen. Yeah, I mean, you, but you would think that most 75 year olds are vaccinated by now. Who knows? I mean, this was starting in February. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, there was a, uh, let's talk about herd immunity for a second. Um, there's a report that came out of University College London today that says that UK, they believe that the UK will reach herd immunity next week. Uh, what do you what do you make of that, and what do you where do you think we are on our path toward herd immunity in the United States? Well, if they think it, then it must be happening. Um, we'll we'll have to see. You're right. right. <laughs> you know, I want to go to Wimbledon this summer. You know, um, so I hope so. Uh, I think we're on the way, and you know, the June fifteenth magic date is something you know where we're going to be approaching herd immunity. I mean, the question that I don't have a good answer to, and I just don't know the, what the answer is is what, uh, what's the overlap between people who've had previous infection and are getting vaccinated? Because you know we, we tend to think of those as two different groups, but there's actually a, a fair amount of overlap and um, you know, they're gonna be protected. But if, you try and, if you're adding those two numbers together to come up with estimates, right. the proportion of the population immune, you have to figure out what the overlap is. Yeah, I saw some numbers that sounded really high in terms of the number of estimates of the number of people in California who who uh, were thought to have had prior infection with, you know, people with known infection times people who were infected but didn't know it, and an estimate that it's like up to half of, of LA or Southern California. Is it, I don't know if you've seen those numbers, but they, they seem high to me. I don't know if, where you think. I use a two and a half as a multiplier. So if we say we have 4 million round numbers, that would mean there'd be 10 million people infected. I mean, it's, it's less than that, it's 3.6, and it may be closer to two as the multiplier. But I th fully think there are parts of Los Angeles, think Boyle Heights, think parts of South Central, where they uh, where we really have had 50% of people infected. I mean, 25% reported cases. Um, so that doesn't strike me as a big stretch. Yeah. But it's, it's fairly limited geographically. Anything we've seen in the U.S. so far that makes you worried about vaccine resistant strains here? You know, we see cases of the South African and Brazilian variants crop up, but they don't seem to be spreading like wildfire. Where no, are they we don't. Yeah, no, I haven't seen anything. That, you know, the numbers of states with more than a few, a handful of cases of those is, is really vanishingly small. And so I really haven't seen it yet. That makes me worry. And the West Coast variant confuses me in that I, the, the data that I have seen says that it's not as infectious or as nasty as the UK variant. And yet you mentioned that it seems to be out competing the UK variant. I would have thought those are sort of the same thing. Yeah, that's teleology for you. You know, you're seeing it through your eyes. You have to see it through the virus's eyes. All right. What does the virus see? <laughs> I don't, for whatever reason, they seem to be pushing it out of the way. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's a more stable mutation. I mean, the, the numbers are that the South, the uh, uh, B117 UK variant is about 50% more transmissible, and the West Coast variants are about 20% more transmissible. But for whatever reason, it maybe it, it it reproduces more viruses. For I don't, you know, I I can't explain it to you, but it's the it's a an issue of fitness, and it's just you know it may be transient. We may have all UK variant here sooner mm -hmm. sooner than later, but for right now, we have way more of the West Coast variants and. Uh, Joe DeRisi, not to uh, not to jump in front of his 
um, is results, um, you know, they, they've been finding almost no cases of the UK variant at 24th admission. Oh, huh. okay. And do we know yet whether the UK variant is more serious than the, uh, one of the things about the, yeah. not the UK, the UK variant we know, I think is they say 60% more, more likely to cause a bad, bad case than the, than the native one. Do we know about the West Coast variant? Is it more serious or just more transmissible? It's more transmissible as far as I know right now. So we're pretty lucky that that is their dominant variant here. If it was the UK variant, we'd be in worse shape. Yeah, like Michigan. Like, like Michigan, except for the, without the ice hockey. Except for without the ice hockey, that's correct. All right. All right, well, George, thank you so much as usual for educating us and bringing us up to speed with things. It's a very interesting stage and hopefully, I mean, it really does sound like we're in a position in California that I guess the last question is like, what could go wrong here? Is there, is there anything that, that, you know, if you sort of say the odds are good that we're moving in the right place? I, I think the odds are really good. I mean, what could go wrong? There could be, a, uh, you know, some un, uh, unknown, previously un, unseen side effect uh, or adverse event from one of these vaccines, like the, like the uh, central venous thrombosis, cerebral venous thrombosis uh, like in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mm -hmm. Something like that happened and it destroyed confidence in the vaccine. Vaccination levels might not get to where we need them to be. Uh, we could run out of supplies because they decide to divert everything to Michigan and Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that could be, uh, it could be something um, uh, we could get a new variant introduced. You know, this, uh, this Indian variant has been described at Stanford now, and, you know, who knows what's going to go on with that. Um, you know, there are lots of crazy things that could happen and sort of biological and kind of economic forces uh, if we divert the vaccine supply. But, I just don't see it happening. We've given 20 million doses. We know kind of how, you know, what the vaccines can do. Uh, we seem to have a stable supply, although that could get diverted, but I don't, it's not going to get diverted in huge numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, so far so good with the, uh, with the variants. All right. Good. Well, that, that makes me feel better. Thank you, George. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Let us bring on Monica and Peter. Hello, Monica. Take yourself off mute if you could. And there's Peter. So before I start peppering you both with scenarios, why don't you just react to what you heard George say? Is it sort of appropriately sunny? Uh, any part of it that surprised you? Maybe I'll start with you, Peter. I mean, to me, it's not, you know, the, the sun is definitely shining in California and I feel great about it. Um, I love warm weather. But the question is really what's in the future. And the, the question for me is not even what's in the future by June 15th. I'm worried about later in the winter or maybe in the fall. I don't know when it's coming, but I'm worried about that waning of natural immunity leading to that, you know, more vulnerable population. I'm also worried about young adults uh, who may not get vaccinated in time. So those are just worries. It doesn't mean I'm not basking right now in the sun. Okay, good, Monica. Yeah, I am not worried about the future. So the absolute only thing that could get us through a pandemic is getting immunity to the pathogen that is leading to the pandemic, period. Nothing. Mast and seam ventilation are tools. And the solution to a pandemic is giving the population immunity to the pandemic. There are two ways to do that. One is the unfortunate way of natural immunity would not want very many people to get cases, though they did. About 30% of Californians had exposure to the coronavirus by a large seroprevalence study that was done and published by the CADPH. Uh, the San Francisco Chronicle uh, uh, showed us that article. Um, and then the second way, of course, is disseminating vaccine, highly effective vaccines. We have them, we're disseminating them, we're giving them out. What will happen when you give a large proportion of the population immunity is that cases go down to such low levels that they can't mutate, they can't create new variants, they can't do a lot of what they're doing now when we have high levels of transmission. And there is nothing in my mind that what, why there would be a surge in the fall or the winter when we are giving, no one's stopping the vaccination campaign, we are giving them out great like gangbusters, I think is, um, George's father said. And so we will get to the end of this pandemic and we will not have surges in the fall and the winter. Great. All right, let's start with a bunch of scenarios. Uh, let's start with the vaccinated scenarios. And uh, 
Monica, why don't we start with you? I am vaccinated. Can I go to the gym, the dentist, get a haircut, eat at a restaurant, indoor and outdoor? And if the answer is yes, 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 it's then tell us what I can't or shouldn't do as a fully vaccinated person. So the answer is yes, 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 yes to all of those. And that's because um, not actually from the clinical trial data, which <laughs> almost almost looks less good than the vaccine effectiveness data. So we have now study after study that's showing us how incredibly effective these vaccines are in the real world. The three largest I really want to point out to is the March 29th CDC MMWR study that looked at vaccine effectiveness across this country when we rolled it out in healthcare workers and first responders. And to put it super simply, Dave, Dr. Dave Glidden helped me, helped me message this appropriately. There were people who were unvaccinated and people who were vaccinated. There was 161 infections in 1,000 people who were unvaccinated. And there was one infection in 1,000 people who were vaccinated. That's how effective these vaccines are. Another good example is the Pfizer press release from April 1st, looking at 40,000 people across the world, including those who've had the South Africa variant. And it's 100% effective against severe disease and death, 100% at six months. Um, so uh, they're, they're even better <laughs> in the real world than they were in the clinical trials, and that's saying something. Mm -hmm. So I would want people who are vaccinated to go and do whatever you'd like to do now and feel really safe about it. Um, the one thing that you should do, and this is, I, I call this social norms, I call this politeness, is that if those are out who are unvaccinated, only some of us are vaccinated, some of us are vaccinated, we're in a twilight period right now here in the United States, I think it's very impolite not to wear your mask and to distance from others in the store, um, or if you're in that restaurant, um, because I think it's, 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 it's a social norm right now, it's not fair, there are a lot of people who haven't gotten vaccinated, not because they don't want to be, but because the eligibility in April 15th opens up to 16 or above in the state. Okay, Peter, looks like, as my wife, the journalist, corrects me all the time, is, is champing, not chomping, but champing at the bit. So, Peter, I don't know if you're quite as uh, you can do everything-ish, but go ahead. It's the scenarios for the vaccinated person. I mean, I love to do things. I'm a go-getter. I love the outdoors. I love indoor dining, all these things. But I still don't know if I'll go to Coachella or be in a mosh pit, even if I'm vaccinated. The idea is that, you know, sure, real world life settings uh, don't encompass all of context. And to me, it's not about uh, every context uh, is the same. It's, it's really about the prob possibility or probability of bringing a lot of noses and mouths together at this period when not everyone is vaccinated yet. Maybe things may change, but the last time I checked, you know, we're not an independent country in California and there's still a lot of COVID happening around the world, making potentially making uh, variants. So, you know, it just takes a plane ride away to come or maybe to a third connection through Sydney to come from Papua New Guinea to the Bay Area where there's, there's a resurgence or from Brazil to the Bay Area. So, you know, I'm, 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 to answer your question, yes, 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 yes. But the larger the crowd, the more the, the more nervous I get. And that because it's increasing the probability that there's somebody in that crowd who is unvaccinated who's going to come close to you? Yeah, so there's several things in that scenario. One is that uh, you're banking that you're going to have an immune response and that somebody else is going to have an immune response from the vaccine, even if you bring a lot of vaccinated people together in a large Coachella situation. But, uh, you know, there is a chance if you're immunocompromised, we've been learning from data, uh, you know, there was a JAMA study, although it was just after one dose of the vaccine, um, that it may not have the same benefit, although, you know, one can say that they didn't measure T cells in that study, um, or that you were just one of the, maybe the 30% or in j, &J or the 5% in Pfizer who, for whatever reason, may not have a response, but that doesn't mean you'll get sick and go to the hospital. But I'm just saying that the risk is not zero. So the bigger the crowd, you know, if you're wrestling in a mosh pit, uh, doing youth sports, then, you know, it, it may not be the right situation. All right, well, that, that's disappointing to me because I do a lot of wrestling in mosh pits. Uh, maybe I'll stick with you for a second, Peter, then I'll go to, to Monica. So, so what, what are you comfortable doing today? I assume you're fully vaccinated. 
So um, are you comfortable getting a haircut? Are you comfortable seeing a dentist? Are you comfortable going to an indoor restaurant? I'm comfortable for all of those things. I mean, I, it still does mean that, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit more conservative in some senses than others, but like if I go to an indoor restaurant, I'd sit by the window or, I mean, I, th I still think there are ways to mitigate risk wherever you go. And when I go to the bathroom in an indoor restaurant with poor ventilation, even though I'm vaccinated, I'd keep my mask on for multiple reasons rather than protecting myself against COVID. But I mean, uh, you know, that's the way I navigate some of the settings in the world, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's, you know, I don't feel much more confident. My force field is there, but that force field, you know, isn't like fully robust yet until I think more people get vaccinated. Okay. Monica, so you, you go, if you had an opportunity to go to an indoor restaurant, windows aren't open, not that well ventilated, tables pretty close together, you're vaccinated, you don't know the status of the person at the next table or your waiter or waitress or, um, uh, and you have to take your mask off to eat. That's why you're there. You Are you comfortable doing that? I am comfortable doing that, but I'm also a really polite person. <laughs> so I, I. Well, you're not so polite to put your mask on and try to eat spaghetti through your mask. Yeah. Or I'm have a mask gonna... with a, you're not going to get one of those masks with the holes in it. So you can like eat through it. Okay, no, I sure. think yeah, those were very weird, by the way. Um, no, so I, I'm quite, and and I don't know if, if the uh, waiter is vaccinated, so I will keep my mask on as I come in. I will uh, politely wear it until it's time to eat. Then I will take it down and I will eat, and then I will put it back on and I will leave. Um, will I keep, when I go to the bathroom, I have to walk past people. It is a social norm right now to wear masks and I will wear my mask. In the bathroom, Peter, I will take off the mask. And the reason is because I probably want to put lipstick on or whatever. But I, the point is that I don't actually think that there's, um, the virus is radioactive. And I am fundamentally protected. When you just said, Peter, that the real world effectiveness, um, we don't know all the variables. In a way, the real world is as diverse and real world as it gets. So when I look at the New England Journal studies of the University of Texas healthcare workers that was published on March 23rd, and then the UCSD and UCLA healthcare workers that was published the same date, those were during surges. We were having a huge surge in Southern California, huge surge in Texas. Um, and also it was a diverse group of people. It wasn't people that are in clinical trials. That's why usually clinical trials look better than, than the real world because they don't have all the complexities of what are people doing outside the hospital? What are people, uh, what restaurants are they eating in? And yet the vaccine effectiveness was even better than the efficacy in, in clinical trials. I can't stress this enough. It was, it was, it was almost impossible to get COVID-19. It was 0.5 out of a thousand in the University of Texas March 23rd study during a massive surge. These vaccines work like I, I, I just, I literally am giddy. Like my head is always spinning with, with how incredible we are in terms of how well these vaccines work in the diversity of the real world. The Pfizer April 1st study was 40,000 people across the entire planet, South Africa, other places, lots of diverse activities and, and going on. And still they were 100% effective against severe disease. These vaccines are amazing. You should right, feel protected. Right. Talk, talk me down, Monica. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I, 63 year old guy. I've gotten Pfizer. It's got, there are some, there's a failure rate. Um, I'm comfortable doing a whole lot of stuff I wasn't before. I flew to visit my parents and, and, and there are a bunch of other things I've done. I got a haircut yesterday. But going to an indoor restaurant, taking my mask off in a non ventilated space, I don't particularly want to get even mild. I'm confident I'm not going to get hospitalized and die. That feels good. But I, I don't particularly want to get mild COVID because I don't know for sure that that can't turn into long COVID or some long term consequence that I don't understand yet. Am I being too over the top conservative? I do want to say that I understand why people are nervous and everyone should do whatever they're comfortable with right now. Um, however, I'll give you a good example. My parents are 87 and 80, so they are older than you. And um, you. two weeks after, <laughs> and two weeks, clarify that. Yeah. <laughs> two weeks uh, after their second dose, put them on a plane and I brought them over here from 
Salt Lake City to my um, household that has two unvaccinated children and a vaccinated adult uh, child, who's me. And we hung out together, we hugged, we spent a lot of time together. And then the last night we went to an indoor restaurant. Um, it was so good. Uh, and um, we were all sitting there. We were um, very respectful of the social norms of masking when the waiters came back, uh, came by, but we were in an, in an indoor restaurant in San Francisco. I felt perfectly safe. Why? Because, and I love, I actually really love my parents. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it, it is, it is again, the, the data that has convinced me so much that, um, that what you're quoting with this, this possibility of getting 5% in the Pfizer and Moderna trials of getting COVID was in the, um, was in the clinical trials. And I don't want them to get severe disease. It's hundred percent effective against severe disease. And then even the rare amount that would get a, a mild COVID infection, because I know how few cases there are circulating in the particular city in which I live, I knew that of the, for example, 15 people in the city who were um, diagnosed with COVID-19 yesterday, four people in the hospital, at my hospital and six at yours, um, that likely I, I was not exposing my parents to COVID in a low case environment. Right. And that's what we're going to experience as we go on with time. So everyone should do what's comfortable for them right now. But as we go on with time, as the cases get very low, you know that you just can't be exposed to those cases, just like I didn't think my parents would be exposed to the 15 cases. Well, not, 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 I guess not can't be, but the probability becomes really Very low, low. sorry, really yeah. Low. yeah. Know, if it's 15 new cases a day in a city of 875,000 people, right. probably gonna run into one of those people is awfully low. Peter, any, so, any, any, any comments on this? Before, then we're, we're gonna move on to travel. Yeah, and... I mean, I, I would say a few comments. I mean, I think overall, Monica, believe it or not, are saying the same thing, um, but again, you know, it's it's that individual risk assessment. And, and again, if Monica's parents were coming to, and maybe if Monica lived in Michigan and her parents were coming to visit her there, it would be a very different risk yes. benefit calculus. So yes. I'm just saying that, you know, I'm, I'm watching the environment. I'm seeing what's happening on the parts of the country and I'm willing to have growth mindset be flexible. The other issue about the CDC study, I'm like completely gangbusters about but whenever you look at healthcare worker studies, just in general, I'm always just a little bit suspicious that they are also doing other things apart from just having the vaccine as their only uh, protection against the ills of the world, um, just uh, as a caveat. Yeah, I think one really important take on point here is, is, is your protection comes through vaccination, but also relates to how much virus there is in your community. So the, you know, how you would respond to this may differ in San Francisco today than if you were in Detroit. And so that's, that's I think, a key point for people to understand. All right, let's talk about travel for a second. Peter, um, one of our viewers said, you know, want to go to New York City, which is having a little bit of a surge. Uh, go to hotels, go to restaurants, go to museums, go on the subway, go to the theater. Anything about that any different, particularly with the travel component? Do you think about getting in an airplane any differently or getting in taxis or Ubers any differently? I mean, I do feel a little bit more um, ebullient about that. Or not, I guess ebullient isn't the word, but uh, more, um, you know, real, uh, confident that I'm, I'm protected. But it, what it means is I'm still keeping up my game of wearing that mask. Maybe I wouldn't have like a double mask or face shield on a flight across the country. But, you know, I'm, I'm, if I can sit by the window and put on the ventilation, and definitely I always wear my mask in the airplane laboratory. Um, maybe if I take it off and if I wear lipstick, I'll put it back on. Um, <laughs> She's but, quite obsessed about the bathrooms, I, I, I noticed. I, no, because there's this woman who got COVID while wearing an N95 mask in the plane, but then she took her mask off in the airline laboratory and she got COVID. So I've been imprinted with that <laughs> memory. That hence my fixation, but bathrooms is on not bathroom. generally, yeah, okay. it's not I got generally it. a fixation. But All but right. yes, I think I would be comfortable on that journey. And and so do you see you see the planes now? Uh, I mean, we're long past the days where you can count on the middle seat being open. It's, it is filled yeah. <laughs> today. You know, they've cut out so many planes. So the middle seat's gonna be filled. You're gonna be shoulder to shoulder with people you don't know for six hours. Uh, you, you know, everyone's wearing a mask. You don't really know what kind of mask they're all wearing. Uh, the airplane turns into a little mini restaurant also at times. Yes. They take their mask off for their, their wonderful meal. So <laughs> with all of that and you're flying, let's say you're flying to Michigan or flying to a more high prevalence place where you can't say this is a San Francisco crowd anymore. It's probably a mixture of where you came from and where you're going. 
Does that change your thinking at all as you decide whether to get on the plane? I, I know, forget about the bathroom for a second, Peter, just the rest of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, actually, I feel very comfortable, you know, based on the, the efficacy data, Israel, CDC, healthcare workers studies, UK, and some communities, I feel very comfortable in general with, with my risk assessment on an individual level. I just wouldn't, you know, I would not, I would still keep my mask on and not feel, not just for politeness, but just because of, I'm going more into uh, unknown territory or mixed risk territory versus yeah. if I were flying within California, for example. Okay, makes sense. I have to say, when I flew a few weeks ago to visit my folks, uh, I kept my mask on, particularly when the meal was served. And then about 45 minutes later, I took it off briefly and wolfed something down. Uh, Monica, how about you and travel? So I, um, I will, yes, of course, mask on the plane. And I actually think we'll be masking on the plane for a while. And the reason is um, because unlike where I think we can lift mask mandates in municipalities, which I think we should lift mass mandates when everyone who has had the opportunity to get the vaccine can get the vaccine. I think we should no longer have mass mandates after that. On the plane, you have a very mixed bag of people from different countries, different places. And um, I can't be convinced that everyone who had an opportunity to get a vaccine would have gotten received the vaccine on that plane. So I'll be masking on a plane um, for a long time. However, uh, I think that uh, the ventilation is good on planes. Uh, I'll be polite and not put my mask on the plane, but do I feel personally unsafe? No, I don't. Because again, going back to Peter's point about the real world effectiveness, totally take your point about the healthcare worker study. Let's forget even about the healthcare worker study. The Pfizer six month data that was released in a press release on April 1st actually was 40,000 people around the world. And, and may, some of them were doing all sorts of things and having all sorts of risks. And we still saw that 100%, it still blows my mind, effectiveness against severe disease and death across multiple variants of the 40,000 individuals who had received the Pfizer vaccine, multiple professions, multiple settings. Um, and that is, I think, what, what all this real world data that's coming out for us I think it's giving me more and more confidence that I'm very protected. Okay. Um, and so I would, I would just be polite. And then, you know, we're talking, we spent a lot of time talking about vaccinated people and, uh, you know, within hopefully a month or so, everybody will have that opportunity to be vaccinated, but about half of us or more are unvaccinated. So what are your ground rules today for unvaccinated people? Has life changed for them at all in, you know, in the setting of, uh, of a lot of people being vaccinated, but they're still either waiting for their shot or maybe they've decided not to. How do you parse what they can do in terms of all the things we talked about, gyms, restaurants, and and let's say flying? Uh, Peter, you wanna start? Yeah, I worry about the risk group, the risk for folks who are unvaccinated right now, because it's a very, not, I'm, I'm not just speaking about California, I'm just talking about in general in the United States. It's a very different time from April of 2020. And I'm really speaking about the specter of the variants. For one thing, I'm speaking about biology. So there's a new variant of foot, it's more transmissible, it latches onto your receptors like a bulldog and won't let go. And it just continues to keep virus going for many more days than regular COVID that we know about. So that's one thing, biology. But what I'm most worried about is a second issue. And of course, it's going on in a little bit younger age group. The second issue is mainly about optimism, which is a great thing. And, and that's why I love Monica in general. And I'm generally like a half glass full kind of person. But optimism may drive, uh, you, know, you know, that feeling that I may not, maybe I can take a chance and not wear that mask this time or in an indoor gym because it really cramps my style when I'm on the treadmill. I think that's what I'm worried about, both the biology and the sort of feeling that I'm invincible because everyone else feels like they are, even mm -hmm. though I'm not vaccinated. And maybe I might get a fake vaccination card too from Shopify. <laughs> I didn't know you could, all right, doesn't surprise me. Uh, Monica, what do you you think about the unvaccinated person? I guess I've been, it seems to me that there are in some ways more danger now with the variants and with this, uh, uh, you know, this idea that we're optimistic, it's good, the curves are mostly coming down. Uh, you could look at that and just say, yeah, it's 2019 again, I can act like, uh, like everything's great and maybe that's gonna get me in trouble. 
I think it's very important to um, put in your risk equation two components. One is vaccination, whether you're vaccinated or not. And the second is the amount of circulating virus in your community. And therefore, these tiers that we have in California were actually put into place for a reason. There is more mingling that occurs at lower case rates because there is more mingling that can occur because you are less likely to be encountering a virus. So at this point with our very low, we're going to go into the yellow tier next um, week with our very low cases and with the need for people to see one another and to be, um, you know, get exercise and all that, I would feel very comfortable with that unvaccinated people um, being in gyms uh, with their uh, masks and um, being outdoor dining. Again, there's a lot of uh, lower risk in the outdoor spaces. I think we haven't stressed enough the degree of transmission is so, so low outside. There was just a study published in Irish Times two days ago that about one in a thousand transmissions occur outdoor. Um, but if I were unvaccinated, I would not go indoor dining, not because I actually think that I would get around cases, again, because there's such low case rates. So when I went indoor dining the other week with my um, parents, I also went with my children who were unvaccinated, but they're very low risk for infection. And I knew the case rates were very low. But indoor dining, when there is higher surges, has been associated in study after study, when there is more circulating cases with taking down your mask with higher rates of infection. So I think you have to put together those two components when you make your decisions. Right now in San Francisco, we're in a very good place. And I don't think we're going to get out of that place. Um, but I wouldn't go indoor dining in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Okay, which brings up the topic of the kids. So now you have increasingly families with parents vaccinated, kids not. And uh, I love, by the way, you citing both the New England Journal of Medicine and the Irish Times in the same sense. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, so um, you mentioned, you know, that you're not that worried about the kids because they have lower rates of getting really sick and lower rates of getting infected, but non-zero. Um, maybe I'll turn to Peter and then we'll come back to you, Monica, but does all of these equations change? Let's say travel. All right. I'm you know, thinking about flying to New York or flying to Europe if we can, but now I'm, I have, I have some small or medium-sized kids to bring along. So they're unvaccinated. Does that change your thinking about this trip? Yeah. I just look at the, I mean, I think, you know, we've all had to travel for various reasons, if for family reasons, even during the darkest pandemics, people were still traveling and people had to sometimes do that with kids. If, if the risk benefit uh, equations made them travel. So, you know, it just depends on why you're traveling. If you're going to, again, the Great Lakes in Michigan for some a cabin, it's not the right time to bring your unvaccinated kids because they're alternatives. So I always think about alternatives when I think about and the reason for travel. Uh, if you're trying to go to uh, get a beach vacation, maybe Hawaii is better because they're test positivity rate is so low and they've done, they have such great disease screening onto the islands. So that's one issue. And then the other issue is again, um, again, it's not penetrating so much, but I'm just wondering about adolescents and B117. Uh, there's a recent, uh, some data from Michigan showing that the number is just creeping up a little bit slightly. It's going from, you know, the 10 to 19 years old, one in six to, from one in nine to one in six uh, chances of being infected at that age group. So, you know, that just also adds another uh, wrench. But overall, uh, under 12, super, generally pretty protected um, from both transmission and acquisition. 10 to 19, a little less protected, but much uh, more protected than uh, 20 to 50 years old, we know from uh, that science article. So, you know, that's the way I'll navigate the world. Optional, think of an alternative if that destination is Sergi. Uh, family reasons, I will go and just protect your kids. Over the age of two, everyone can wear a mask. Mm -hmm. So Monica, you know, I, I guess I worry a little bit about the kids in that are thinking about them and kind of almost the orthodoxy now is they don't get sick. They're, you know, they're okay. They don't, they, they, they don't catch it as often. They don't transmit it as often. But now in a world where parts of the country, the UK variant is the dominant variant, and that is 60% more transmissible and 60% more, uh, more serious if you get it. Does that change your thinking about now taking along this unvaccinated person you love to the restaurant or to on the airplane? 
Because um, yes, the, numbers, the numbers are a little bit different than they might have been a few months ago. I'd really like to address this question of the B117 variant, um, because there are models that can show that the B117 variant will stick more um, to your cellular receptors in your nose or to respiratory epithelium. However, we actually have the ability to look epidemiologically at data and decide if the B117 is doing the three things that we're nervous about. The first, the three things you'd care about with the variant are, do they have increased transmissibility? Do they have increased virulence? And do they evade the vaccines? B117 increased transmissibility. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rutherford showed us a map of the places in the country that have the highest levels of B117. One is right here in, the, in California, and we're not all surging at the same rates. Uh, Michigan does have a high level of B117, and there's a lot of transmissibility there. So does Florida. However, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania are the other three states, and Colorado and uh, California have much higher levels of B117. During the uh, rollout of um, the UK uh, vaccine rollout program, they had 91% uh, UK variant B117, and yet they managed to keep their cases very low. Uh, Israel, same thing, 80% of B117. They did see increases at the beginning with transmissibility, and then once they got to 40% first dose, uh, cases came down, but they actually plummeted. Second is virulence. Well, there's actually the most simple question, the, the most simple way you can figure out if something's more virulent, forget about the laboratory studies of sticking, um, is do we have increased hospitalizations per case? It's the most simple metric you can imagine about the degree of severe disease from a variant. And hospitalizations per case have not budged. They have not gone higher in places that have high B117. All that data is available from the CDC. You can just do a simple math equation. So 20 cases in front of you, there should be five people hospitalized out of those 20 if B117 was so much more virulent, not just one. And the hospitalization per case rate is not budging and has never budged in places with high levels of B117. I do not think it's more virulent. And then the third is it doesn't evade our vaccines. T cells are the main way that we that we control viral replication. Remember antibodies um, can, can come down over time, but our T cell responses, which are harder to measure, and it's why we don't think about them as much, is how we fight viruses. And our T cell responses are intact. Per Dr. Red, an article published uh, through NAID, through Dr. Seti, multiple articles now showing us our T cell responses preserved against B117. So I'm comfortable uh, with my children, even in the face of B117. Great. I think we have time for one more right, to wade into this because it's 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 complicated and and but uh, it it inevitably comes up since we've spent a fair amount of the time parsing the world between vaccinated and unvaccinated people, and as you both said, there's somewhat different rules about what you can or, or standards what you can and shouldn't do if you're in one category or the other. Uh, where have you landed on the idea of vaccine or immunity passports or authentication? other than it's gotta be better than you can go online and get a, a fake one for, for, for $1.50. So let's assume there's a decent system to actually have a real fraud proof mechanism to prove people are vaccinated. Uh, Peter, where have you landed on whether that's ethical and whether that's a good idea? So basically um, the writing's on the wall, whether or not we like it or not, it's happening. It's happening in New York, LA is looking at it. Uh, airline companies already have this in progress. Um, and the Biden administration is getting involved, not to make it, but to advise on it, which is a great thing because whatever we're doing now, it's kind of the wild west of verification. Whether or not we go to a QR code like Israel is one question, but then people have brought up the question about um, passport uh, equity or access to that because you kind of have to need your smartphone to then show the QR code. So if you don't have a smartphone, that's the issue. So that's one thing. It's happening. The second issue is until we have all equal access to the vaccines, um, then it becomes an ethical issue. And I think that's why the WHO got involved. Um, if you have activities just for people who are vaccinated and people who aren't vaccinated don't have access to those activities, then that's fraught with ethical concerns. If you have alternative ways for people who are not getting vaccines to show that they're safe, i.e. some sort of testing strategy together with vaccine people, 
it may be less fraud, like what the 49ers are doing in terms of having people come to games. You know, it's, it could be nominated or in the test to basically get into that game. So these are the issues that I think about. I think it needs to be more, much more robust than we have now. It costs, you know, people can really spend money and get it done. People have done identity theft with people taking selfies with vaccination cards. So uh, whatever is happening now needs to be more streamlined, has to be equitable, and everyone has to have equal access to the vaccines. Right. So sounds like you're okay with it, with better system and probably waiting a couple of months when everybody could have been vaccinated if they chose to do that. Monica, maybe last point we got in a, in a minute. Yeah, I agree with um, uh, Peter that it's so unfair to give vaccine passports if some of us who desperately want the vaccine can't get it yet. Um, but it likely will happen in private settings with employers and whatnot, because these are private settings. And when we all have the opportunity to get it, it's going to become a different ethical um, decision than it is now. Great. Thank you both for a very instructive session. Fewer fireworks than I expected. I think <laughs> both we like much. each other. We totally I know like that, each that other. part. That part's clear. That's uh, <laughs> we're both pretty much on the same page. I mean, uh, yeah, we're go friends. Ahead. No, I said if Monica and I can have. A quest, you know, a quote unquote fight outside of Vic's chat. I think brown rounds is nothing. Yeah, yeah that's where that's where I confronted him. Stop saying there's going to be a forced <laughs> surge in California. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you both, and thank you, George, for being on today. It was a terrific session. Again, we'll post this tonight on YouTube at about seven or seven thirty. Next week, we'll be back for a another uh, medical grand rounds, non COVID theme topic, and then we'll be back with a COVID uh, topic two weeks from today. Until then, stay safe and uh, get vaccinated the minute that you can. Thanks so much.